Hello, everybody, and welcome to the meeting. Um, I'm going to give you a talk on scenario planning for adaptive management, which is some of the results uh, from the Avara workshop discussions. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to give you a few background uh, slides just to orientate you. Here we see a nice image of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge extending all the way from Iceland to the equator. Uh, if we look in detail at a bit of ridge axis, this is actually from the South Atlantic, but it's a very nice image. We can see on here the axis of the ridge itself, where new crust is generated, indicated by the white lines on this slide. And as the crust is pushed apart, it generates a series of uh, troughs and uh, hills in, in uh, elongate parallel to the ridge axis. And some of these hills can extend up uh, even a few thousand meters above the axis of the ridge. Active vents are shown on here as red triangles, and you'll see that they're quite close to the ridge axis itself, usually within a few kilometers or maybe up to 12 or so kilometers away from the ridge axis. The axis is also broken up by these offsets, which you can see in here, particularly at the bottom, the larger ones being called fracture zones, and we will come back to those later in the talks. You can see on this slide, looking at the uh, contract blocks belonging to uh, Ifremer and France, that uh, they're very much concentrated along the axis of the ridge and uh, very much dependent on where those active vents have been found at the moment or where expected active vents are likely to occur in the future. Um, some work was done a few years ago, looking at the uh, ridge axis, um, particularly in the area around the Azores, and uh, they identified this lower bathyal press, which extends from 800 meters to three and a half thousand meters water depth, and about 400 kilometers either side of the ridge axis. In this area, although it's the ridge axis with lots of new rock being generated, even here, much of the area is covered in sediment and up to 95% of the red area may be sediment covered. This is because you get a rain down of um, material from the sea surface, which relatively quickly smothers the seabed and, and varies um, all the outcrops. So the rock outcrops are relatively rare in the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, a few around the margins, a few on seamounts, and some along this mid-Atlantic ridge. But by and large, most of the Atlantic Ocean is covered in mud and soft sediments. I wanted to make the point that uh, mining for sulfides is very much similar to mining on land. We have mines for similar types of deposit, zinc, lead, copper, gold, silver. And it's very much a three-dimensional mine. So the aerial extent of this mine will be really small, a square kilometer or so. And this is very much different to the mines for nodules which are essentially two-dimensional deposits, and the mines for crust, which are also two-dimensional. So we might expect the conservation measures for sulfides to be very different for those for some of the other areas. I show on here two hypothetical mines. They're just south of the N on this map. Um, they're 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, which is probably much larger than mines will ever be. But even if we put a 20 kilometer radius plume around them, you can see that the footprint is still going to be pretty small, especially if you compared this to, for example, nodule mining. So let's summarize the geology. The mines for polymetallic sulfides are going to be very similar to those on land and individually are going to have small aerial extents. Exploration is concentrated within a few kilometers of the ridge axis where the sediments are thin or absent simply because they can't look through much thickness of sediment to identify resources. Future exploration may include areas with a few meters of sediment cover further away from the ridge axis, but at the moment it will be limited to these areas. There are some indications that a relatively small number of large deposits may exist um, on the, in the North Atlantic, and some indications that deposits at active and inactive end sites but the largest are always likely to be at inactive vent sites where the whole process of the hydrothermal venting has concluded. The other major thing we need to take into account in looking at um, sulfide deposits and, and in fact all deep sea mining is the effect of plumes. I managed the MIDAS project which ended a few years ago and in that project we did some plume modelling, particularly on ridges, 
And you can see here two examples of plume models showing cross-section of the ridge in, in uh, grey and then the coloured area showing the modelled plume in impacts. And you can see that uh, the very heavy impacts are within a few kilometres to 10 kilometres or so from the mine itself, but that the impacts spread and can be felt for many tens of kilometres away from the mine site. What we don't know at the moment is how far those impacts will have an importance on organisms. So a little bit of background on the faunas we might be likely to see. For the hydrothermal vents themselves, the faunas are globally unique and tied to the vent site, so the animals don't live in any other environments. At the moment, we only know of about 50 square kilometres in the whole um, Earth's surface where these type of vent faunas occur, although more area may be found in the future. And even here, we know that these faunas vary uh, with at least 11 different provinces known where you get different species or different associations of species. And faunas are often very dense, many specimens, but relatively few species. So these are really quite unique environments. We have uh, a number of vent sites have already been identified, as you can see on this map located along the ridge axis. Uh, those in red are known uh, and have been um, verified as having faunas on them, and those in yellow are expected to have faunas but waiting to be verified. The spacing of active vent sites globally is predicted to be between 64 and 74 kilometres. So they're reasonably well spaced along the axes. It's not a continual line of active vents. And in some work we did previously, we looked at the larval dispersal distances for animals that live um, along uh, active um, vent areas and uh, found that these were very much in the same sort of ballpark, about 100 kilometres for invertebrates and 74 kilometres for non-vent invertebrates. This means that if some of these areas of ridge were mined completely, then it would be difficult for organisms to um, maintain their life cycle and life cycle and uh, uh, do uh, connectivity between one site and the next. In addition to the vent organisms, there are a number of organisms that uh, would be regarded as um, uh, VNEs um, in other organizations such as the FAO, Vulnerable Marine Ecosystems. These include corals, sponges, and aggregations of corals and sponges, which you can see here. We don't know where these occur very much at the moment, but we expect to find quite a few along the ridge axes. Some of these corals can live really, really long periods, such as 2,000 years for the black coral, uh, which has a very slow growth and uh, slow to reproduce. So the ridge is pretty unique. Exploration is currently concentrated within a few kilometres of the ridge axis, where the sediments are thin or absent. Hydrothermal vents are also limited to within a few kilometres of the axis, and this area also provides the rocky and some sedimentary substrates. These rocky substrates aren't common in the Atlantic and may only form 5% of the ridge axis. Rocky substrate faunas include the structural species such as corals and sponges that are regarded as VMEs. So now to some of the results of the Evora workshop. Um, this is a plan view of the seafloor, and you can see on here the ridge axis in the black line being offset here and there, and the maximum extent to which we expect uh, exploration to go even in the projected um, several years into the future. Most current exploration is very tightly tied to the ridge axis. So in Evora, we suggested some of the fracture zones are in need of protection, and that most or all of the vent sites, uh, the active vent sites, should also be looked at in terms of protection. When mining comes along, we will expect that the contractors and scientists will have gathered a large amount more information and the pattern, uh, the seabed may look a little more like this. More new vent sites will have been found, a lot more inactive vent sites will have been found, and some areas of these VNE type um, aggregations of sponges, corals, or other organisms such as acorn worms, which might require VME type status, may be identified. So I'm going to go through some scenarios of how a contractor might um, want to look at the uh, um, feasibility of a new mine site. 
So here you can see the um, proposed mine site is over an active vent with a plume around it. And so we would need to have a mechanism to look at how that new active mine site could be looked at in terms of protection. Should it be prote protected with all the other <coughs> protective um, vent sites on this part of the ridge? And what is the process for determining that? Then we need to look at the process for determining the impact area of the plume, because even if an area is not mined, it might be destroyed or heavily impacted by the plume itself. We need to think about the area that should be surveyed to make sure that the contractor is not accidentally impacting an area that by um, the spread of the plume over to that area, and, and what area should be um, surveyed to achieve that. And in Evora, we suggested a buffer zone around areas of protection, and we need to establish how big that should be. On here, they're shown as a couple of kilometers radius. So in this slide, I mentioned earlier that there's likely to be areas of coral, sponge, and other VME type criteria. The ISA doesn't have uh, any VME um, type criteria at the moment, but it may wish to establish some to give protection to these types of area that we see on here that should be found with additional mapping. So what would be the process for protecting some or all of these areas of what I call here significant habitat? What is the threshold for defining this type of habitat? Surely not one sponge, one coral, but how much would require um, protection measures to be brought in? What is the threshold for defining a plume impact on this type of habitat? And is the threshold the same for different habitats? In other words, the plume might have a much lesser impact on a, a, an active vent site than it does have on this type of VME type criteria. And can we accommodate predictions that plumes will not be radially equal? Because the ridge has these elongate ridges and troughs, the spread of the plume is likely to be more linear than circular, but it may be easier to define the impact of a plume as a circular um, process. And what about variation of the plume spread with time due to local current changes? How, how do we build all this into a model which enables protection ultimately? So presumably, eventually, these large areas of um, significant habitat would be given some, some sort of protective status. I'm going to give you some examples of uh, how feasibility might be looked at. So here we see an example of a mine with its plume, which doesn't impact anything else. So presumably, there's no problem with that. Here we see another example where the plume comes a little close to the protected area around an area of significant habitat, VME type habitat, but it doesn't impact it, so presumably that's okay. In this example, the plume impacts an active vent site, which has been given some protection, so presumably that would be more problematic. In this example, the plume impacts a small area of significant habitat, but that's below the threshold for some protection. So presumably that one is feasible. In this example number five, the act of putting in the mine site affects the hydrothermal flow to the vent site and actually turns it off, thereby killing the vent fauna. So how would that be dealt with? And it would probably have to be dealt with by a very good geological model before mining was allowed, and then some sort of monitoring to make sure that the model was proving to be accurate. You can also see on here lots of areas of mining, and we need to think about when the total area of mining for any um, stretch of ridge axis becomes too much and a cumulative impact threshold is reached. I mentioned the problem of plumes, but there are probably good engineering designs to limit the spread of plumes. But if plumes could not be limited, they may be much larger than my previous slides. And this shows what the effect will be then, that the plume impacts just about everything on this slide. And so everything would, uh, it, all the protected areas would be impacted. And so good equipment design should lead to a lot more mining in these types of scenarios. And finally, I want to look at um, the impacts in midwater. So, here, the returned water plume, when the ores are taken to the ship and dewatered, and that water is put back into the ocean, at the moment it could be put back anywhere below the thermocline, which is around about a thousand meters water depth. 
Here it will impact midwater organisms such as filter feeding organisms, and it may also be toxic and affect a range of other organisms through the toxins it, it may contain. And it's very difficult to measure the impacts here because some of the organisms may be mobile and swim in and out of this in, impacted area. Others just drift and may drift in this, uh, in this water for some considerable time. There is a deep scattering layer between 300 and 500 meters, which has a particularly high biomass uh, of organisms, and it would be wise to avoid that area as much as possible. And also at about a thousand meters, we get the SOFAR layer, which is um, the area where sound travels great distances in the ocean and it's probably used um, for communication by marine mammals. So the questions that we addressed in the Abora were, would it be better to discharge the returned water near the seabed? And I think we all agreed that it would. Should the returned water be treated before its release? And this is what happens in other industries such as the oil industry. And should noise be kept below specific thresholds in the sofa layer and potentially at the seabed because the act of grinding the rock to generate the ore may in fact be itself very noisy. So all of these questions need to be addressed before we have a robust um, plan that brings everything into a coherent um, protection of the marine environment or at least those elements that need protection. Okay, thank you. I'll finish there.